Welcome to Exploring the Gospels. In today's message, Meet Matthew, Dr. McLuhan reveals that Jesus saw more in Matthew than he ever saw in himself. For more than 15 years, I've been the member of a book club that meets every Friday morning in downtown Norfolk. Each week, we discuss what we learned in the chapter that we have just read. We're currently reading a book called 50 Christians that, that every, 50 persons, excuse me, 50 persons that every Christian should know. And the book is about men and women whose faith in Jesus has impacted the lives of many people. One of the high points of finishing a book is that sometimes we are able to meet with the author in person or by Zoom and ask him or her questions about the book that we have just read. There's something that is very powerful about meeting a person who has first-hand experience with what they have written about. The testimony of an eyewitness to an event is always a powerful thing. Today we'll begin a new series of messages exploring the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We'll meet the authors and the accounts which they wrote on the life of Jesus. We'll take time to learn about each of the writers, how they met Jesus, and the impact that he had on their lives. We'll explore what is known about their ministry after Jesus returned to heaven. All of the authors of the Gospels knew Jesus personally or had access to eyewitnesses who knew him personally. And all of them completed their accounts of the life and times of Jesus within 20 to 60 years of his resurrection and ascension back to heaven. The Gospels read with an authenticity that is unique that only eyewitnesses can give. This makes the sayings of Jesus unique in all of religious literature. For example, the sayings of Muhammad were not written down until more than 300 years after his death, and the authors had no access to any living witnesses to him. The intimacy of the writers of the gospel, the intimacy that they had with Jesus and those who knew him is evident in their writing. Today we'll meet Matthew. The longer I walk with Jesus, the more I am impressed with the choice Jesus made to invite Matthew to follow him. And I am equally impressed with Matthew's courage to leave everything that he had achieved in life and follow Jesus. When Jesus called Matthew to follow him, he was working for the Roman government as a tax collector. Now, if following Jesus did not work out for Peter and Andrew and James or John, they could easily go back to fishing. In fact, they even tried to go back to fishing. Matthew, however, could never return to the business of tax collecting, and he would never be accepted by his Jewish community. In their eyes, he was a traitor. He had already been expelled from the local synagogue and barred from attending all social events in the community. Following Jesus cost Matthew everything. Matthew was the eighth of the 12 apostles called to follow Jesus. And when Jesus called Matthew to follow him, he was going by the name of Levi. That's what people used to call him, Levi. But it seems that after Jesus called him, he came to be called Matthew. It's possible those were both names of his and in different periods of time, sometimes people go by different names. But Matthew is a beautiful name. It means the gift of God. I'm sure at that moment in his life, his parents didn't think of him as a gift. They thought of him as a traitor. But Jesus certainly saw in Matthew the person who was indeed a gift from God. Matthew is without a doubt the most controversial apostle Jesus chose. The backstory of how Matthew came to follow Jesus is fascinating. We'll pick up this story from Luke's account and then switch over to Matthew's own testimony. Turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. In verse 17, we read these words. On one of those days, 
as Jesus was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village in Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal. What a fascinating text in Scripture, and what an incredible gathering of religious people. They were actually in the home. They were in the home and outside of the home of Peter's mother-in-law, the lady whom Jesus had healed. It was a place where the power of the Lord had frequently been released, and people gathered on that day to meet with Jesus. I believe that the power of the Lord is present today, present to heal right now as we gather and as people are watching this message. If you have a loved one who is sick, I encourage you to call or to text, invite them to watch this message as we ask God to release his power in the lives of people. As we continue reading, we learn that a paralytic man was brought to Jesus by four friends. They lowered the man through the roof into the home where Jesus was teaching. That's always been a stunning thought to me, but when you realize it was Peter's mother-in-law's home, it was a lady who was on the brink of death, and after uh, she was healed, she just gave her home. She didn't care what was going on so long as people were being touched by Jesus. We read, when Jesus saw their faith, he said, man, your sins are forgiven you. Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. The scribes and the Pharisees and Sadducees began to question, saying, who is this who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God? Luke chapter 5 and verse 21. Now, Jesus immediately knew what the religious leaders were saying amongst themselves, at least in their heads, if they hadn't yet said it out loud. Why do you question in your hearts, Jesus asked. Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise up and walk? Matthew, Luke chapter 5, verse 22 through 23. But that you may know, that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise up, pick up your bed, and go home. Luke chapter 5, verse 22 through 24. The people in the room were stunned into silence as they watched the man get up without any help, pick up his bed with the stretcher that he was on, and walk out with any physical therapy, the man went home. Truly a remarkable event. The stunned silence turned into joyful celebration over what they had just seen before their very eyes. A lame man walked. This is what the Bible says. Amazement seized them all, and they were glorified, and they were filled with awe, saying, we have seen extraordinary things today. Luke chapter 5, verse 26. I've had the joy of seeing people get up and walk, and it is an extraordinary moment when people who are lame are healed. I believe extraordinary things will happen during this hour. You may have had a high fever like Peter's mother-in-law or paralyzed like the man in the story, I would release the power of Jesus to heal you today. Migraine headaches go in Jesus' name. Paralyzed legs and arms be healed in Jesus' name. Cancers of all kinds go in the name of Jesus. You just felt the power of God come upon you. Write to us and let us know what God has done for you. Now, news about a healing of a man like that spread like wildfire in Capernaum and especially the part where Jesus said he had authority to forgive sin. You may be wondering, what does this story have to do with Matthew? It is what Jesus did after he healed the paralyzed man that is the point. It is at this point that Matthew interjects himself in his own gospel as an eyewitness to these things. Jesus passed on from there. He saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and Jesus said to him, follow me, 
and he rose and followed him. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 9. This is the first time we meet Matthew in his gospel. Now, which statement that Jesus made, I have authority to forgive sins or get up and walk, do you think interested Matthew the most? I believe it was without a doubt the first statement Jesus made. Uh, while it made the religious furious, the religious leaders furious, it offered the tax collector the most hope he could have ever heard. Matthew had never met a person who had power to forgive sin. He knew that he was a sinner, and he had no hope of being accepted by the religious community in which he lived. And the words of Jesus offered hope to Matthew that he had never heard. Further, Matthew testified that Jesus saw him. It just goes by us so simply in the text, but for Matthew, it was very different. See, when most people looked at Matthew, they looked down or away immediately. They would never make eye contact with him. They didn't want anything to do with him. But Jesus made eye contact with him, and Matthew chose a particular word in the Greek language that describes seeing in a very meaningful way. The word Matthew chose means to look with intent at someone. Have you ever had somebody just look with you with intent? It means to be especially impressed. It means to see with the purpose of becoming friends or of visiting with that person. Sometimes you meet a person and you know you just have something in common and you know you just want to get to know that person more. Matthew didn't have people look at him like that. When Jesus saw him, he felt something in his spirit. It means to see something above and beyond what one merely sees with the eye. Jesus saw beyond what the people around Matthew saw in him. Jesus saw in him what God saw in him. The most important decision Matthew ever made was to come at a great cost. He left everything behind to follow Jesus. Uh, for Matthew, I think it was simple, for neither money nor the power of Rome compared to the blessing of having his sins forgiven and following a man with the power to heal people. He never met anyone like that. So let me ask you, what have you left behind to follow Jesus? Or maybe a deeper question, what's still holding you back and what's preventing you from fully following Jesus and trusting him? the way Matthew did. He's still inviting people to follow him. And all that he is asking is that you, whatever he asks you to walk away from will be worth knowing that your sins will be forgiven and that you will go to paradise when you die. So many people write to me wanting to know, can I know that I will go to paradise? And I assure you, you can know you will go to paradise just like Levi knew that he would go to paradise. So Jesus saw many qualities in Matthew. He saw someone who was a risk taker. He saw someone who was a sacrificial follower. He saw someone who would become an incredible witness. And he saw someone who was to become a best-selling author. The Bible remains the most popular book in the world, and the Gospel of Matthew has always been the first book in the New Testament. The New Testament is the most translated book in the world, and more New Testaments have been given away or sold than any other book in all of printed material, even with modern printing means. What did Jesus see in Matthew? He saw a risk taker. He saw a sacrificial follower. He saw an incredible witness. He saw a best-selling author. He saw in him a bridge builder between people. Now, the main trade routes between Africa and Asia and Europe all passed through the Middle East. And one of the most important branches of this trade route ran between Damascus in Syria and the cities of Egypt 
And this route was called the Via Maris in Latin or in English, simply the way of the sea. And this route coming down from the Golden Heights, the most important city that was next encountered was the town of Capernaum. This is one reason that Jesus based his ministry in Capernaum. And traders passed through Capernaum every week on their way to or from Damascus and did business with Matthew and all the things that needed to be taxed. Now, what was typical in these cities is after the heat of the day was broken, people gathered to hear news from Egypt and all the stops along the way. Would you join me for an evening of Arabic coffee and wild storytellers by the traders in Damascus who had just arrived from Capernaum? The traders were famous for their fascinating stories, and the more often they told it, the longer the story became. And just when the traders were about to settle down for the night, a trader who had just arrived said, oh, there's one more thing. Everyone needs to know. Levi resigned his position as the tax collector in Capernaum. I was the last person that he cleared. Well, you could have heard a pin drop around that campfire. The traders were stunned. And somebody said, what happened to Levi? And after a while, the traders stopped shouting at each other. He spoke again. He said, Levi left his position to follow a newly arrived rabbi who opened the eyes of the blind and opened the ears of the deaf. Nonsense, everyone shouted. Nobody can do that. No, it's true. In fact, you know that lame man whose friends used to carry him wherever he needed to go, the one who's begged from all of us. Again, they began shouting and cursing and, and some spit and uh, another riot broke out. And the man said, this Jesus said to him, get up and walk. And he did. And After that, Jesus passed by Levi and said to him, follow me. And Levi left everything to follow him. Now, it did not take long for this news to spread around Damascus again like wildfire. And the next day, people from Damascus began taking their sick and lame family members to Capernaum to look for this man and ask that one to heal him. Now, turning back to what Matthew wrote, we read this, chapter 4, verse 24. So Jesus is fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all the sick and those afflicted with various diseases and pains and oppressed by demons and those having seizures and paralytics, and he healed them. It's a remarkable statement. It is the influence of Matthew following Jesus. So what did Jesus see in Levi? He saw a bridge builder. Because of Matthew's influence, Luke wrote in his gospel, people will come from the east and the west, from the north and the south, and recline at the table in the kingdom of God. Luke chapter 13 and verse 29. What a tremendous testimony to the influence of this man. So what did Jesus see in Matthew? He saw a healer. All 12 of the apostles healed people. And if Jesus could use a person like Matthew to heal people, I know that he can heal through us. And so we say, blind eyes be opened now in Jesus' name. Deaf ears be opened now in Jesus' name. Lame feet walk by the power of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for touching people right now who are listening to this message. And while we have been asking the question, what did Jesus see in Matthew? It's equally worthwhile to ask this question, what did Matthew see in Jesus? He saw a powerful healer. He saw a beautiful savior. He found the acceptance that he had looked for all of his life. I hope today's message has prompted you to ask yourself this question. 
what does Jesus see in me? And Jesus is calling you to follow him today because he sees more in you than you could ever imagine. Give your heart to him. Follow him with your life. He's willing to use you beyond anything you could have ever imagined. And I believe there are people watching this message to whom Jesus is revealing the truth of what you are hearing. You tried all your life to find acceptance by God. Some have seen for the first time that Jesus is more than a prophet. He is the one who walked with the favor of God upon his life. He is the one who has authority to forgive sins because he paid the price for our sins to be forgiven. I invite you to ask Jesus to forgive you for all the sins that you have committed. Ask Jesus to lift the weight of the sin off of your back. Ask him to fill you with his holy presence. Say with me, thank you, Jesus, for dying for me and my place on the cross to pay for my sins and inviting me to walk with you with the favor of God. You just prayed with me to accept Jesus as your Savior or were healed while listening to this message. Write to me and tell me about your decision to follow Jesus. Thank you that you see in us more than we see in ourselves. Thank you so much. We come today to follow you and to live under your mercy, your forgiveness, and the favor of Father God like Jesus. Help us to see you as you really are, our greatest friend, companion, and Savior. Amen. We hope this message has filled you with living hope in Jesus. If you would like to talk to someone about your spiritual journey, please leave a comment or send us a private message. We enjoy reading your notes and having an opportunity to pray with you. If you received a blessing through this message, please share it with others. We invite you to become a Living Hope Partner by donating as little as a dollar a month through our QR code. Your gifts will help us create new messages and reach more people. Living Hope is a ministry of Ingleside International Incorporated. All donations for Living Hope qualify as a charitable contribution. Thank you for your prayers and support. Next week, we will continue learning together from the Word of God. God bless you and fill you with living hope.